Hello, so good morning, Island Ecology students. My name is Kaylin Hernandez. Um, I'm with Cape Fear River Watch, and um, I've been asked to provide this presentation for your class. Normally, I do this presentation at Lock and Dam 1 on the Cape Fear River, which I'll be talking to you a little bit about later on in this presentation. Um, but because of the pandemic, we've got to go about doing it this way, um, which is not my favorite way of doing things. I would much rather be right there in person giving you a presentation. Um, this is something that's gonna be a bit of a learning curve for me, so please be patient throughout this um, Zoom presentation, and um, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm gonna try and share my screen now. Okay, and we have to get to the beginning. All right, so hopefully you can see my face in the corner there and um, and you're now looking at the presentation. Um, so usually I'm asked to give a little bit of background, more background about myself than usual, um, giving presentations because it's an island ecology course. And um, I, I had once managed nature parks um, in the Caribbean on an island. Um, so again, my name is Kaylin Hernandez. Um, I have a degree in um, biology with an emphasis in wildlife management and fisheries. Um, I started out um, my career working in the Florida Keys, um, where I worked for the Nature Conservancy for a little bit, teaching, um, well, instructing scientific diving um, to volunteers, where we managed um, or did some research on sea urchins and damselfish. Um, then, and we did some water quality studies too with a program there. Um, and then I worked for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, on the National Key Deer Refuge. Um, which was a really great job. I worked as a wildlife biologist there, um, studying these key deer, which were just um, basically subspecies of the white-tailed deer, much smaller, um, and they're an endangered species down there for, for various reasons, a lot of issues associated with that status and, and the locals there. Um, and then I worked for the Department of Environmental Protection um, in the Florida Keys, um, within the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, and did a lot of research and programming there. Um, and I moved on from NOAA, that was a NOAA position, um, to manage nature parks on an island in the Caribbean called St. Eustatius. Um, Stacia is a seven mile by three mile island um, in the Netherlands Antilles. Um, so it was a Dutch island. Um, there, was a, th there were three nature parks. One was a marine park, which surrounded the island from the high water mark to about 30 meters or 90 feet in depth. Um, and then within the marine park, there were marine reserves. And those um, areas were meant to set aside species um, that were, you couldn't catch fish within those reserves. And that was in order to, to, um, to be sure that there were fish and resources for future generations. Um, and then there was a national park, which was a dormant volcano called the Quill. Um, and I was busy establishing trail systems throughout the, the, that national park so that some of the delicate um, flora wouldn't be trampled upon. And um, then also there was a botanical garden, which was really challenging on the island. It was in the middle of a salt blast, and um, so to grow things was a bit of a challenge, but it was donated um, and meant to be used for that purpose. And so that was a constant um, struggle, but I believe today it's looking beautiful. Um, I keep up with the people. Um, with the national parks and the marine parks there in St. Eustatius. So um, <clears throat> in one way, it was a dream job because I'd wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I don't feel like diving or hiking or gardening today. Um, but also it was a real challenge because the local people weren't really ready for conservation. Um, there was an ordinance established on the island to protect those resources. And um, it was already there when I arrived, but it had never been enforced before. And so that's when I realized that environmental education is so important. Um, Stacia was like a little microcosm of all of the same issues that you see almost everywhere. Um, and I realized that in order um, to, to really make a difference that my focus needed to switch from research or enforcement to education. Um, and that's what I'm lucky enough to do now with Cape Fear River Watch. I've been with them now for 10 years. Um, Cape Fear River Watch is a 501c3 um, nonprofit environmental organization. We're based here in um, Wilmington. So our mission is to protect and improve the water quality of the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, we do that through education, advocacy, and action. And we do that for all people. 
Um, there are five of us with Cape Fear River Watch. Um, Kent Burdett is our river keeper. Um, Cape River Watch fall, um, falls under the Waterkeeper Alliance um, umbrella. So the Waterkeepers Alliance is an international sort of watchdog, waterways watchdog group. Um, there are river keepers that, that fall under the Waterkeepers Alliance um, worldwide. Some of those river keepers have organizations that support the work of the river keeper, like Cape Fear River Watch. Um, that's what we do. Um, and other river keepers are standalone river keepers um, looking after their particular body of water. So um, Kim Burdett's our river keeper, and then we have our executive director, Dana Sargent, um, and then we have um, a new communications membership person on board now, um, and her name is Charlie. Um, she just started yesterday, excited to have her, and then we have Patrick Connell, um, who is, uh, manages our boathouse, and he's also um, out there doing a lot of um, water quality monitoring for different issues that we're gonna be discussing today. We also have an AmeriCorps member, her name is Audrey, this is her last month um, with Cape Fear River Watch as an AmeriCorps member. So that's our team. So a little bit about um, the Cape Fear River Basin. Um, the Cape River Basin is the largest river basin in the state of North Carolina, as you can see on this map. Um, the Cape Fear River Basin is roughly the size of New Hampshire, so a lot of space there. It's considered to be a biodiversity hotspot. Um, there are 14 different types of ecosystems um, um, in North Carolina's coastal plain and within the Cape Fear River Basin. Uh, that sound you hear is my dog drinking water right behind me. Um, that's why this is presentation is gonna be different. Um, so yeah, 14 different ecosystems within the Cape Fear River Basin. And um, that doesn't include the six different types of um, aquatic eco ecosystems found here. Action is one of the arms of our mission um, here at Cape Fear River Watch. Um, so what does that mean? So we paddle, um, we do a monthly series where when one of them is where we take people um, all around different tributaries um, on kayaks. Um, it's a way for us to get people out there um, understanding what it is that needs to be protected. Um, we clean up, we conduct monthly um, watershed cleanups. Last year alone, we picked up over eight tons of trash from our watersheds. Um, we monitor, we study, um, we do research and monitor water quality. We have a science, um, citizen science program right now called Creek Watchers, um, where volunteers will adopt a certain creek section and um, do basic water quality observations, um, fill out a report and send that to us. Um, and that's gone to a second level of, to where some volunteers are actually doing some, um, taking water quality samples and those are being evaluated. Um, and what this does for Cape River Watch is that it gives us a basically a screenshot of the a basic health of that particular section um, of a creek or waterway. Um, so we do a lot of different things at Cape River Watch, a lot of action. and um, and this is just a way, we just try and figure out a way to make um, people in our community care um, about the river just like we do. So advocacy is another huge piece of, um, of what Cape Fear River Watch does. Um, we want to be the voice of the river. So we speak up for things that, um, that make our river cleaner, healthier, um, more beautiful. And um, when policy decisions are being made um, that can impact the river um, in any way, Cape Fear River Watch makes sure that we are a part of those discussions. And, um, and Kent Burdett, our river keeper, is a champion at um, advocacy for Cape Fear River Watch. Um, he's won a lot of awards lately um, and been recognized nationally. Um, he's been on the Rachel Maddow show even and has just, um, been an amazing champion for our river basin and we're very lucky to have him here as our river keeper. Um, a little bit about why we're advocating. So this is um, the Atlantic sturgeon, an old photograph taken. I just love this picture. Um, it's a federally endangered species um, and so is the short-nosed sturgeon, um, which isn't quite as large and all Atlantic sturgeon don't, don't, um, aren't fortunate enough to make it this big as either, but they have a lot of um, hurdles um, in their way um, in the Cape Fear River. Um, anadromous fish populations are down by as much as 90%. Um, an anadromous fish is a fish that spends um, 
its adult life in the open ocean and then it travels um, upstream into freshwater systems um, and it gets to trying to get to its original spawning grounds um, and that's where it will spawn and reproduce much like um, sea turtles are going back to the beach where they were born that's what these anadromous fish do too. They go off, they spend their adult life in the open ocean, and then they travel upstream into freshwater systems. So it makes them a really special kind of fish because they're able to, um, to regulate that way and spend time both in um, full on salt water as well as um, complete fresh water um, where they go and try and find their way up to. Um, and in this case, I'll show you a map of, of where exactly, but. Um, one of the hurdles that was bringing their populations down um, were these locks and dams um, that were um, built over 100 years ago on the Cape Fear River. Um, the reason why they were built was um, to carry goods up the river. So these, these systems were built before um, our road systems were built. So that's how long ago um, these things were established and they're kind of obsolete at this point. Um, except some people believe that those, those uh, dams are still needed to, um, in order to create um, a way for us to pull water for our drinking water supply. Um, that's being studied and debated. Um, so, but for now, um, what's happening is that our fish want to go, those anadromous fish want to get all the way up to that orange line there, it's a fault line near, um, near Fayetteville, and that's where they're trying to get to spawn and to reproduce. Um, but along the way, they have um, three hurdles, Lock and Dam 1, Lock and Dam 2 and Lock and Dam 3. This is what it looks like, um, Lock and Dam number 1. So um, you can see that the dam is to the right of this and then that lock system is over to the left. Um, so it gets to that point and the fish is like, damn, can't get over. So um, Cape River Watch advocated for this um, fish passage and it's called, this particular type of fish pas passage is Rock Arch Rapids. It's been proven um, to be really effective for a lot of different um, types of fish, different spe fish species. Um, so this was in the beginning phase of construction for the Rock Arch Rapids. Um, this happened in 2014. It was a 12 and a half million dollar project. This is what the Rock Arch Rapids looked like upon completion um, of the build. And so you can see that um, that there, there are these pockets of rocks. And it was proven to be more successful for shad than for striped bass. And the three types of anadromous fish that are struggling to get up to those fault lines um, for its original um, spawning grounds are um, American shad, river herring, striped bass, and then also the, um, our sturgeon populations are all trying to get up and over. Um, so, it, after a few years of studying the success of these rapids, it was determined that they needed to be modified. Um, and so that's what's currently going down now. Um, those um, Rock Arch Rapids are, um, are in a phase to be modified and reconstructed. And also Cape River Watch is advocating for fish passage like this at both um, the other two locks and dams, two and three. So here you can see Joe Fassendola. He's with the um, North Carolina Division of Marine Resources. He's known as the Sturgeon Surgeon. And um, as you can see, he's, he's putting in a tracking device here. Um, he actually installs three separate tracking um, devices in each fish, um, including this three inch cylinder um, that has a sonar device and it emits a signal and it's picked up by receivers um, along the river's edge. Um, I asked him one time if, if, if he felt like there was any rate of mortality associated with these surgeries that he does on the sturgeon. And he said that um, as far as he knows, all of the fish that they've tagged and tracked um, have been healthy and have not suffered, at least not due to, to this procedure. So um, here are where some of the receivers were um, placed along the river's edge. So that's the Rock Arch Rapids at Lock and Dam number one, an aerial view of that. And you can see every, each one of these red dots is where those receivers were placed. And so um, if the sturgeon swims up to the, the Rock Arch Rapids and to that lock system there, and we get the ping, um, and then if it uses the Rock Arch Rapids, there's not a receiver there. Um, so if you get the ping before and after, um, then we know, it we know that it used those Rock Arch Rapids. Um, if we get the ping um, before and then in the lock, and then after we know that it was locked through, they've actually during um, 
during certain times of the year, they'll, um, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers will put a person there at the lock and they actually wait for um, schools of fish or, um, or solitary sturgeon if they see those. Um, so usually the shad will school up and they open up the locks to let them through. Um, that has about a 30% success rate. Um, so that's, I think, being done less now since these rock arch rapids were installed at Lock and Dam 1. It's still being done at Lock and Dam 2 and 3. So that was one of our advocacy issues. It was fish passage um, to restore fish populations in the Cape Fear River. Um, another huge thing that we are focused on right now are concentrated animal feeding, um, concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Um, there are more of these factory farms that are concentrated in the lower Cape Fear River Basin um, than anywhere else on planet Earth. So I'm going to say that again. More CAFOs, more of these concentrated animal feeding operations that are concentrated right here in the Cape Fear River Basin, the lower Cape River Basin than anywhere else on the planet. So you can imagine that there are a lot of issues um, associated with that type of thing. So this is a map showing how many um, swine like these are just hog farms um, factory farms that are in the lower cape river basin the circle is, is um, outlying the river basin area and then all of those that are concentrated um, within the river basin so a whole lot um, of farms and so what's the big deal with that well um, there are more than 10 million hogs that are produced annually um, in the cape Fear river basin and that's just the hog farms and there are other obviously animals that are being produced here as well. We have 10 million hogs produced annually here, but we have 16 million turkeys produced annually and more than 300 million chickens produced annually. And I'm pretty sure that that statistic has gone up. Um, we have a moratorium on the number of hog farms that can be built here. It's, they're done, they can't build anymore. Um, but with chicken farms that there's been no cap and so they continue to explode those numbers right now. And Patrick Connell um, is, is busy out there in the field monitoring um, uh, these chicken piles, these litter piles, and water quality up and downstream from both the hog farms and the chicken farms. Um, so a lot of the waste associated, especially with the hog waste, well, with the chicken waste too, contains some really nasty stuff, E. coli, fecal coliform, um, arsenic, and other heavy metals. There's a high level of nutrients, um, nit nitrogen and phosphorus, that facilitate algal blooms, it contributes to eutrophication, um, it dissolves, it lowers the dissolved oxygen in waterways that can create um, fish kills and all other kinds of problems with wildlife. Um, so, and the way they treat the, the fields um, or, the, or the waste is that um, the hogs will produce waste underneath them. They're brought out on these sort of conveyors underneath and put into a pond that they call lagoons, which is just a really pretty name for a pond full of pig crap. Um, and then in order to be sure that this doesn't overflow, um, they spray the, um, the, the pig waste all over nearby fields. Um, a lot of issues associated with that. Um, you have people who are living around these hog farms and mostly people of low income and color who are being um, impacted, their health is being impacted by these spray fields because when it's windy, um, that spray is picked up and carried on to those near, near, nearby neighborhoods. Um, we've actually gone inside um, some of these homes um, and taken swabs and um, have found pig DNA on the inside of these people's homes. And so there are a lot of health issues associated with breathing this in all of the time. It's just a bad model, the CAFO model. It's bad for the farmers that work there. <clears throat> it's bad for the nearby residents, it's obviously bad for the animals um, and for us, the consumers, and, um, and of course for water quality and especially the environment. Um, and while we're talking about animal agriculture, um, it's just something that needs to be said. Um, if you look at any, uh, any environmental issue, whether it's climate change, water use, um, land-based destruction, rainforest destruction, species extinction, um, animal agriculture um, is the number one impact um, to any of these environmental issues. So it's something that we should all be thinking about. We should be thinking about what we're putting in our bodies. We should be thinking about what we can do to reduce our impact to the planet. Um, and eating meat is, um, is one of the things that we can consider 
think about um, the amount that we eat and whether or not we eat it um, because again it has more impact on all of these issues that I discussed um, than, than any other issue and um, so it's something that you should think about and um, this is normally when I'm in front of a in front of your class I get a lot of questions and discussions at this point and I hate that I, that we can't do that right now but at the end of this presentation um, please feel free to email me with any questions that you may have or comments and I'm more than happy even to, to discuss these things with you at the end. Um, Colash is another, um, another advocacy issue that we are focused on. Um, Colash is the waste material that is left behind after coal was burned. Um, so that includes things like arsenic and mercury lead, um, over a dozen other heavy metals. Um, and many of those are, are toxic. Um, so even after um, coal, the current coal burning power um, facilities upgrade to cleaner fuels, these, um, these coal ash ponds remain. Um, so Sutton converted, um, Sutton Power Plant here converted in 2014 to cleaner fuels, but then the, the um, storage ponds remained um, with all of those nasty things. Um, so that um, when those coal ash ponds remain, um, they continue to leak into groundwater, um, polluting our aquifers and threatening human health um, and the environment. These two fish um, were taken out of Sutton Lake um, and Sutton Lake is um, adjacent to the Sutton Power Plant. It's their cooling pond. Um, and so you can see that this top fish is a little bit deformed and um, of the samples taken, um, the majority of these fish were deformed and a lot of them are, are just packed full of selenium, which was one of the heavy metals that impact um, these fish. So um, human health impacts from some of these and, and neurological effects um, from coal ash or um, cancer, um, health impacts including heart damage, lung disease, kidney disease, reproductive problems, um, birth defects um, like in these fish, impaired bone growth in children, um, some really nasty stuff in the coal ash. And yet um, there is a dock that is on Sutton Lake that basically encourages people to fish there, including a cleaning station. Um, and the people who keep and eat these fish um, normally aren't people um, that are out there fishing recreationally. These are people who are fishing to put food on the table and are impacted. Um, by those heavy metals. Another, um, another huge thing that Cape River Watch is focused on right now with our advocacy work is Gen X. I would imagine most of you have heard about Gen X and what it is. Um, so it's, it's produced by Kim Wars um, on, it's an industrial site on the Cape Fear River. It's about 100 miles upstream from Wilmington. Um, it's owned by DuPont. Um, and so it was a while back, a couple of years ago, um, there was a study done that showed that Gen X and, um, was found in water that had already been treated by the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority here. And so that meant that people have been consuming a Gen X for, for a very long time here in this region. Um, so, and Gen X is just a small piece of a much larger issue. Um, there are a whole lot of other compounds, not just Gen X, um, that, that have negative impacts on, on human health. Um, and we don't yet even know the extent of these impacts, although more studies have ensued since this story broke. Um, and we're learning more and more about the impacts to, to humans um, with these um, PFAS. So, um, but it, it's, it's not an issue that's specific to the Cape Fear River or to Kim Wars. Um, this is an issue that's, that's happening all around our country and, and in other parts of the world. Um, and it's something that we have to focus on the fact that this has to be handled at the source, that citizens shouldn't be expected to filter out contaminants that are discharged into our drinking waterways. Um, anything that's harmful to humans shouldn't be discharged in the first place. And um, that's what our advocacy work is focused on, um, trying to stop it at its source and um, that's where the attention needs to be focused on um, with Gen X and any other PFAS. So education, this is the one that's near and dear to me. Um, Cape Fear River Watch is, um, has been doing some environmental education programming since I came on board 10 years ago. Um, 
I think environmental education is more important today than it ever has been as our kids, as our population is becoming more and more attached to their media devices and less attached to nature. Um, it's been shown that this has a huge impact on the development of children and teenagers. Um, yeah, each hour per day spent watching TV or using the internet or any other media devices um, during your 10s associated with poor grades at age 16. Um, and the average American teenage child spends between 40 and 65 hours a week connected to some kind of media device. Um, that's alarming. That's a lot of time connected to a media device. So the answer is to uh, get them outside. So environmental education is one way um, to combat what's happening here. Um, so there was a study shown in Finland there, this is where um, students are scoring the highest on all of their tests um, worldwide and they outperform every other country in the world over and over and over. Um, so it's crazy that the, the average student there, um, they have a ton of recess. The US kids, um, some of them don't get it at all. Um, I know that my middle schooler was getting 12 minutes outside just and it's just a very low amount of time outside during school. Um, so physical activity um, outdoors, not just for kids, but also for adults um, and in the nat natural environment, it doesn't only aid in, um, in, an, in a longer lifespan, um, greater well-being, um, fewer symptoms of depression, lower rates of substance abuse, um, and it also increases your ability to perform better at work and also at home. So um, getting outside and exercising is really important for all of us and for the environment. Um, Cape River Watch has, um, does a program called Raindrop Journey. Um, we developed it a few years back and we've educated over 4,000 fourth graders. Um, we go into their classrooms before the trip and we um, um, go over what they're gonna be seeing the next day at Greenfield Lake. Um, and then we give them an eco tour, take them out on paddle boats where they make um, basic water quality observations and then they play this game called Raindrop Journey. That's a sketch of it in this slide and how they play where they basically um, are characters acting out as either raindrops, um, the bad guys, which are pesticides, fertilizers, animal waste, oil and gas from cars, trash sediment, all the non-point source pollutants, um, or BMPs, the good guys, where they're cleaning up those non-point source pollutants. And then at the end of the game, where they're running and chasing and tagging and being active outdoors, they come out either clean or dirty. And then we talk about how that happened and then we switch up the play of field and have more pollutants or less pollutants and that sort of thing so it's a great way for them to not only visually learn um, something that they've already gotten a lesson the day before but to go out and act it out and see how it actually plays out in reality um, when more non-point source pollutants are used in a watershed and especially one with a lot of impervious surface you're going to have more stormwater pollution dirtier water more fish kills and all of the negative impacts associated with that. When you have more BMPs or best management practices installed in those watersheds, um, you're gonna see that the water's gonna be um, cleaner at the end. So um, that's Raindrop Journey. Um, we also go into one third of all um, eighth grade classes and give this Enviroscape presentation, which is a model that visually enables children to understand how our waterways are being impacted by these non-point source pollutants. Um, we've developed um, at Lock and Dam number one, we um, got a contract with the Corps of Engineers, a cooperative agreement rather, um, to have an education center there. So we have an office space there, we have a presentation room, and we've been busy establishing some infrastructure there on the property so that we can start offering more environmental education programming at Lock and Dam one. So um, we had a grant and have continued to get, receive funding to, um, to have an interpretive rain garden there. Um, and then we have an elevated boardwalk that was installed after the cooperative agreement was um, made. And um, so we're busy out there um, trying to get it all ready so they can bring more people out to the Lock and Dam. Um, and this is normally where I see this class at the Lock and Dam, we give a presentation in there, and then um, a tour of the Rock Arch Rapids, the boardwalk and the rain garden. Um, Striper Fest and Lake Fest are our two um, biggest educational events of the year. Um, the education committee at Cape River Watch um, helps to put this on, especially Melissa Juhan, who's on our education committee. She sort of leads all of the Cape River Watch stations, um, creates them and um, directs them along the way. Um, we have over 40 stations um, at each event 
Um, some of those are Cape River Watch stations with volunteers and interns. Um, and then other of those others, uh, some other of the stations are other organizations in town, um, either nonprofits, um, governmental or private, focusing on some sort of um, issue related to the environment, whether it's water quality or wildlife um, or research. Um, they're there. So um, these both of these events have been steadily growing um, in 2000. In 2020, we had more people at Striper Fest than ever before. And in 2019, we haven't had 2020s yet. We had more people at Lake Fest than ever before. And um, both the events are free to get in. And that's something that Kate, that's really important to me to be sure that people, that like all kids are able to participate in our environmental education programming, um, no matter what their family's income level is. Um, summer camp program. Um, this year, I'm not sure if we're going to go through with it or not because of the pandemic. Um, it's still up in the air, but it started as a pilot with a homeschool group and it's grown since then. Over 50% of our kids are on a full scholarship. Um, and again, that's a way to be sure that all kids, no matter what their family's income level is, um, can attend these um, high quality environmental education programs. Um, so We've received a few grants along the way to be sure that we can offer um, those kids the, the free tuition into our summer camp. Um, and I developed a long range plan back in 2014 for our summer camps and have been following that along. Um, and we've established partnerships along the way. So the Wilmington Housing Authority is one of our partners. Um, we actually go to those facilities to pick up campers and make sure that they make it to camp because sometimes they don't have access to transportation that can get them there. Um, and Whole Foods um, provides us um, healthy um, vegetarian meals so all of our campers throughout the week because we found earlier in the program that kids from low-income families were bringing um, food that had no nutrition, uh, no nutritional value, whereas the kids who um, can't have, could afford to come to the camp um, had their protein and their veg and their fruit, and, um, and that just gives, um, gives them a kind of a leg up, um, which isn't fair. So for at least one week, they were playing on a, they play on an even playing field when it comes to nutrition and um, Whole Foods um, gives us a, a discount on, the, on those lunches. Um, so the intern program is near and dear to me. I'm the supervisor for the intern program, interns at Cape Fear River Watch. Um, we wouldn't be able to do very much of what we do, especially me, um, without the interns at Cape Fear River Watch. They um, are highly valued. Um, it's not the kind of internship where you come and answer the phone for an organization. Um, you um, interns are creating um, curriculums. Interns are leading programs. They're finding volunteers. They're representing Cape Fear River Watch at all of the events around town. Um, and so if you're interested in being an intern at Cape Fear River Watch, please um, hit me up at the Let's see this last slide here. Um, you can see my email address there. It's kaylin at, at cfrw.us. Um, if you'd like to come intern um, with Cape Fear River Watch, please shoot me an email. Let me know that you saw this presentation um, in the Island Ecology course, and we can go from there. Um, we Our summer internships are full um, positions, but we have openings for the fall and, of course, spring 2021. And that's it for me. So if um, you guys have any questions at all, again, please email me. Um, I wish you all the best of luck. I hope that we get through this summer um, with uh, the least amount of impacts to our health because of this pandemic and, can, and one day things can get back to normal, although I think that's going to be a different kind of normal. Um, all right. Thanks again, guys, and have, have a good day.